Hello, welcome to my latest video. This one is the first of two parts about the 100 Club in Oxford Street, London West One. We'll just play the introduction music and then I'll be straight into it after this. Stay there. Right, the 100 Club. Hi, my name's Jeff Horton and I'm the owner of the 100 Club at 100 Oxford Street, which is where I am now. This is going to be more controversial than most of my videos. Well, not this one particularly, but more the next one. Because, well, this one's going to be quite controversial too, because there's a certain legend or legends being built up about the 100 Club, that it's like this iconic place where innovation and they look out for new stuff and they nurture it and they and, and they're really helpful and all that, which my experience of that is not strictly true. Let's start with the history of the 100 Club. Right, back in 1942, which as you will recall was in the middle of the Second World War and bombs were falling on London. The advantage that the 100 Club has is that it was in the basement. So not safe from bombs, but a lot safer than if you're in a penthouse or something. But, of course, they didn't really have penthouses then. Did they? It was called Max Restaurant back then at 100 Oxford Street. A guy called Feldman hired out Max Restaurant to put on a jazz night, which back then consisted of um, like Glenn Miller style swing, I suppose. <laughs> But it was supposedly quite innovative at the time. So this guy came along, hired the restaurant, put it on. By 1948, um, he had taken control by then and was calling it the London Jazz Club. In the middle of the 1950s, a guy called Lynn Dutton took over the 100 Club. And because he's the agent for Humphrey Littleton, who was a rising star of jazz back then, he called it the Humphrey Littleton Club. Um, sometime in the 1960s, it was taken over by Roger Horton, who is the father of the present lessee. Because the 100 Club, let's get this straight, the 100 Club is not owned, it's not like a freehold that someone owns. Well, somebody does own it, but it's not the Horton Lay. It's actually a property company, and the 100 Club pays rent to him. So whoever's in control of the 100 Club doesn't own it. Well, they own the name and everything else, but it's like the, they don't own the bricks and the mortar. So anyway, by the 1960s, it was putting on stuff like, well, this is my interesting time because it was my, I was far too young, obviously, to go there. And not to mention I was, I was hundreds of miles away at the time, but it was putting on stuff like the Kinks, the Rolling Stones, the Who, the Pretty Things, and then American acts like um, Muddy Waters and B.B. King and, and Jackie Wilson and people like that. And it was really exciting at the time. And then, of course, by the 1970s, on the 20th and 21st of September, I think it was, 1976, the 100 Club Punk Festival took place, which featured the Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Damned, and a load more acts. And that was the first real punk um, show in Britain. And that was obviously iconic. They used to have punk on quite regularly there on, I think, Tuesdays and Thursdays. They had reggae on occasion. And also, there's a guy from South Africa called Julian or something, I can't remember his surname, he used to put on revolutionary African bands from South Africa, apartheid thing on there, and they used to be quite um, controversial. And uh, I know that Margaret Thatcher hated the fact they were having these things on at the 100 Club. But anyway, this is all good, it's all great stuff. And then, they had the brick pop explosion and all these other things that happened and then up to date anyway. So if you want to see more of the history of the, of the 100 Club, look on the 100 Club website, which tells you quite a lot about it. But the one thing that it doesn't tell you is that all these things that happened, these innovations at the 100 Club were nothing to do with the people that ran the 100 Club. And we'll say that now. It was to do with the fact that independent promoters hired the club, often paying very high rents, because I used to pay quite high rent there. But this is the thing. Roger Horton and his son Jeff Horton would never take a chance. So all this bullshit about you know, the 100 Club being the innovative home, all these things, it's more accidental. It started because Roger Horton, back in the 1960s and 70s, was a big fan of trad jazz. That's all he's interested in. If he could get away with putting on trad jazz seven nights a week, well, actually, no, Roger would probably want to put it on five nights a week because he wants two nights off. But if he could get away with making a 
living, a good living, after just putting on trad jazz, that's all the 100 Club would ever have done, but believe me. But he couldn't. But up to the 19, I think quite recently, up to about 15 years ago, maybe even longer than that, every Saturday night at the 100 Club was trad jazz. Whether, and there was all these things happening around it, but you could never get him well, very occasionally he might give up a Saturday night. Saturday night was trad. That was his night. And he'd go down there with all his friends and he had a fantastic time. And then he retired and his son kept it on for a little bit, but not long. And then it's like how it is now. Well, it's not how it is now. It's actually closed now because of the lockdown, but hopefully how it will be soon again. But because Roger wanted to put on his trad jazz, he had to hire it out to people. And he would basically take money off anybody who would put it on. And he, Roger hated punk, I'll, I'll tell you that now, because he's told me that many times. He hated punk, he hated the punks. The punk thing was because there's a guy called Ron Watts, who was not a punk either, he was a businessman. He made money out of putting on shows. And he saw the, the, the opportunity, in fact, Ron Watts was the lead singer in a band, a band who were like a sleazy rock band, a sleazy rock band called Brewer's Droop. That was Ron Watts. He was not a punk. Don't forget that idea. He was a very good guy. I mean, he made no bones about the fact that he was making money out of it, but it was purely the 100 Club and Ron Watts were not into the punk ideology one bit. They were just interested in making money out of it, which is hardly the punk ethos but never mind despite what you read that is the truth and then he, he was followed quite quick because he stopped doing it i think he fell out with roger about about something or other which people tend to do i did more than once and basically if you fall out with roger or now jeff that's it you will never do anything there again no matter how successful that you are this will happen to me but we'll come to that in the next one right and basically Ron Watts's punk things was taken over by a North London Jewish pair called Ron and Nanda Leslie. And they were not into punk at all either. I think Nanda was a bit more than Ron, but Ron used to hate it, actually, to be honest. But he used to make a lot of money out of it. And that's why he used to do it, let's be fair about it. And um, so that's it. So he used to do that. Um, all the other stuff there, like the reggae stuff, was somebody else paid to hire the venue. All the or the other stuff like when any please wait nobody played there as far as I, I know because Jeff or previously Roger saw them and thought oh this is a fantastic band I must put them on at the club I shall help them along their way if somebody came along and says I've got a pile of shite to put on the stage but I can guarantee you we're going to fill the room and they're all going to spend money at the bar you're in all right so there you go so that's the truth about it let's not um beat him on the bush that's basically what happened and um so there you go so that's the first part of this the second part will come in in, in a few days time when i tell you about my experiences at the wonder club unless of course the lawyers get to me first so thank you for watching if you liked it please like if you didn't like it then don't do anything just leave it alone and um, please subscribe yes definitely subscribe and then press the notification bell so you can be notified of all these wonderful videos as they come winging your way and comment down below. Tell me why I'm so wrong, why I'm an idiot, because that's what's going to happen now. Because if you if you say anything at all against the Sanctified 100 Club, Aya is rained down upon your head. If you think this was a bit controversial, wait for the next one. Goodbye. You tell him! You tell him I'm coming! Tell him I'm coming!